All right, cut, cut, cut. We're not, we're not here for that. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Fun with Films with my co-host, Paul Gray, and moi, Pascal Fintoni. We're back here to celebrate all things excellent from the world of cinema, big and small screens. And today, obviously, back with my friend Pascal, we're going to look into the diverse world of the Batman. And I can't wait. So, I mean, interestingly, this is something that we came up with a few days ago because you, lucky so-and-so, went to see the Batman with um, Robert. Is it Robert pa- Patterson? It is. Because I kept calling him Richard. When Richard, we were Robert, Fred, <laughs> so Fred <sorry>. Patterson. <laughs> yeah. So you went to the Batman. I was very, very envious, and we were discussing it, and I said, do you know what? I know we had something else in mind, but shall we just switch? and do a Batman special to celebrate, in a way, the, the release of the Batman, which is only a week ago at the time of recording this. But also, actually, you and I have loved the character from the early days of the graphic yes. novels, all the way to the TV series, to the first major film from 1989 that was won just before, all the way to the um, Christmas Long Trilogy and more. And we just got excited, didn't we? Yeah, uh, I mean, we had a plan. We had, we've had a plan for quite a while. Pascal did a lot of work for our original plan, and then it was like, yeah, drop it. Let's go, <laughs> Batman. And Pascal's had to do a lot of work in a very short time to make this happen, but it, we're looking forward to it, and we hope you guys love it too. So we've had to set some parameters and, and boundaries because the universe, particularly even from moving images point of view, is vast. So this is fun with films, and we've chosen to talk to you and go back in time to today, 2000, to 2022, with just the films where the character is the sole superhero. So there would be no TV series, there'd be no animations, there'd be no kind of um, Justice League type uh, adventures, even the Lego yeah. movie. Suicide, Suicide Squad tie-ins, Batman versus Superman tie-ins. It's so hard because we, you know, we've got comics, we've got music, we've got TV shows, we've got animated TV shows, animated movies. We could go on forever about the Batman. Um, so, Pascal, in his infinite wisdom, being the boss of all all things awesome on fun with, with films, um, it's the main movies only, where he is the sole um, hero, sure. as it were. Now, don't be disappointed. There's still nine movies to get through. And some of those movies I have not seen for such a long time. So the format would be we watched a trailer with you. We're going to then react, reminisce, tell stories about what it was like when we were much younger watching th- those movies. Yeah. Paul has brought some surprises as well. Uh, I've got a couple of things to show you as well. So we're just going to have fun with films, Batman special. As a reminder, this is a family-friendly show. So please do share views and, and kind of um, opinions about the world of Batman movies. But keep the language clean. Um, you know, I think, bear in mind the news at this moment in time, if we could just have a moment where we can all be relaxed and be kind, yeah. that'd be lovely. All right. I'm just checking quickly. Um, if you're live, I've got my phone next to me. I want to say hello cool. to Jenny Weatherburn Hi, Jen. and to Denise Fintoni, who is also our line producer. So if there's anything happening live, you come knocking on the door saying, sort this out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Schoolboy era me last time turned the mic off and didn't realize, apparently. So, yeah, eh, it was we just need that, help. It was just that tiger claw of yours that is so, <laughs> so powerful. So some of you may know the format. Um, this would be a trailer talk kind of extended version. So a couple of casualties. We're not going to do the Watchmen. We're not going to do um, Back in Time because, in a way, it is done by uh, the Trello Talk. Yeah. But we will have the big question because I know you like this segment. And we will have the Batman quiz, which so happens to be called officially... Riddle me this, riddle me that. I mean, you could think that we've been planning this very carefully. You, you would think, right? We're people not that smart, but you could would think. People accuse us of being smart, <laughs> yes, and that's not really the case. Um, just before we do kick off... Um, there, there, there's been Batman around for a very, very long time now. Obviously, it started in silent, um, some, well, not silent movies, sorry, radio shows, then movies. So the first one was 1948, I think the first movie, the next one, 49. Mm. But we're starting when? We're going to start in 1966, just after yes. this. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
So, needless to say, just in case there are some confusion out there, I was not born in 1966. Neither were you. Yes, he was. <laughs> he was <laughs> not, al- he was already old then. I mean. And as someone that obviously was um, um, brought up in France, uh, uh, arrived in the UK about 30 years ago, I never, I've never seen the um, Batman series. Had you seen the movie? The, the 66 one? Yeah. No, never. <gasps> So what I'm going to watch um, with you, Paul, I've never seen before. Well, just... this is obviously a travesty. <laughs> and we're now correcting some things in international relations with France that will just sort out any animosity there's ever been. The mutual love of 60s Batman. Yes, I mean, Brexit could go away if people watch Batman yep, together. completely. Right, let's get in touch. Emergency. Batman speaking. Warning all of you to brace yourselves for big news. The biggest. Tell them, Robin. Holy surprises, Batman. It's really exciting. Soon, very soon, Batman and I will be batapulting right out of your TV sets and onto your theater screens. That's right, Robin. Our first full-length motion picture feature in color opens a whole new world of thrills. The big screen gives us more space on land, sea, and in the air to challenge the most bataclysmic collection of super criminals that ever plotted to take over the world. Number one, the Riddler. Question, who's going to make the feathers fly and knock Batman and Robin out of the sky? Number two, the Joker. Have you heard this one? It'll kill you, Batman. (laughs) Number three, the Penguin. There are two eggs this wily bird is going to scramble. Batman and Robin. (laughs) Number four, the Catwoman. Oh, you're going to see the perfect crime when I get Batman in my claws. And that's just a sample of the exciting exploits ahead in our first feature motion picture. Holy memoranda, folks. Make a note not to miss it. Good thinking. Robin, um, I, I would watch that, but um, what do you mean you would? You yeah, should no, have already. I, I, I would watch that. So I, I think it's bataclysmic, <laughs> and he has a severe case of the William Shatner's the way he talks. I would definitely want to have some <laughs> perfect time with Catwoman <laughs> as well. I love that film <laughs> so much. I tell you what. Joking aside. Um, I watched that as a kid, obviously, in syndication reruns. It was one of the things when I may have gone to my grandmother's house at dinner time and sometimes at her behest may not have gone back to school for the afternoon session quite a lot. And we would watch Batman on TV, the old King Kong movies, Tarzan, Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, it was syndicated in kind of the 80s still. So you, you're talking 15, 20 years later, it was still playing here in, in the UK. And I have such fond memories of, of Batman it being a live action cartoon, essentially, is what it is. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's very tongue in cheek. It's very fun. Um, it is and did move away, obviously, from what Batman had been previous in the comics, the the, the gritty realism and violence of it. Uh, but it was very much a, a series and a movie of its time, which was that kind of 60s, sanitized, family, suburban, American, friendly, nicey, nicey kind of um, TV show. And it's just so much fun. Um, so it's 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 shocking to me that you have never seen this. It's just either I missed it completely from French TV. Um, I, what I will say is that when the next one that you saw popping in earlier was released in the 1989 one, there was the documentary. And I was watching those two guys running around in this very, very colourful outfit thinking, oh, I, I just, you know, and we saw you know, the, yeah. the punching and the, the power and the ka kind of appearing. I thought that was maybe like a, like a one-off. But uh, I hear yeah. stories, and Denise will tell me, the moment the music started, which we, we, we played you know, when we began the show, people just ran in, in, indoors. It was huge. It. it was absolutely huge over here. It was so colourful. 
and fun. And it was so tongue in cheek in that it played almost like a Scooby Doo kind of episode. It, adults could watch it and kids could watch it and see two different things. It, it was it was very very interestingly put across because it was very tongue in cheek. It, it was almost like Benny Hill. Mm. You know, you could watch Benny Hill in one way, but you could watch it in in another way. And this was the same. But they had so many talented actors and actresses as guests in it. Um, Playing the villains, but also... Well, I'm just watching, reading the poster. Are we talking about the Burgess Meredith? We are talking about the Burgess Meredith. Um, obviously, if anybody's unaware, he was Mickey in, mm -hmm. in the Rocky movies. Um, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of actors and actresses that worked on Batman struggled to get work afterwards because they were typecast as being kind of comedy or mm. for kids TV. Um but he went on to have a very, very um, renowned career, obviously. And yeah, he played the Penguin. He he was iconic as the Penguin. Now, I've seen and watched um, interviews with Burt Ward in particular, who tells stories that this was a, a blast um, for him to, to be part of, but they spared no expense, particularly for the, the first few seasons. Yeah. This was a very expensive endeavour. Designed, as, uh, um, you would see them as a family prog uh, program. So they took away the darkness that would reappear yeah. in, in future ones. Um, but I would imagine, yeah, for people who had been reading the comic book since the uh, early 40s, 20 years later, to have your hero on TV and with that fail, you know, every week yeah. there'd be a new adventure and you can wait for which villain will be essentially being taken care of. I, I just imagine it would be quite exciting. I mean, Burt Ward. Um, was great, but Adam West playing the Batman had it all. He had the voice, mm. he had the suave Bruce Wayne look, which was, you know, the, the, the way it was portrayed at the time. The gadgets that had the Batmobile, which was absolutely iconic, the 60s Batmobile. It's the Lincoln Fortuna concept car. Um, if you've never seen it, it, it's just wonderful. There's nothing else like it. But he had a Batmobile, which was which had a sidecar mm -hmm. um, for Robin to ride in. They had the Batcopter, you know, all this cool stuff, all these gadgets, and it it was just wild and crazy. Um, I always remember loving. Uh, he'd go into his office, and it was like kind of you know a, a library, a gentleman's library, and a big desk, and he had a, a busk a head. And he'd lift the head up and turn a switch and, you know, the the, the bootcase would open and then he had the, the bat yeah. uh, poles that they would slide down to the bat cave. And I remember as a kid, it was like a cross between Bond and... and That's it, and yeah, yeah. It yeah, was yeah. brilliant. So much fun. Wow. Now, honestly, something that um, completely uh, passed me by. And fans then had to be very patient because it wasn't until 1989... That Batman really came back on the big screen. I mean, I mean, the '60s Batman was almost, to a degree, a victim of its own success. It was so big, nobody could really follow it. But it was also very much a product of its time, mm. which killed the idea of doing Batman ever again for a long time because nobody really could take it seriously. But also you couldn't do it as well as it had already been done. So it took a long time to, to bring the concept back. But, I mean, one thing I loved about it was the list of villains that were, mm. you know, brilliant but also ludicrous. Um, King Tut, <laughs> you know, was crazy. The Ventriloquist, the Mad Hatter, yeah. um, Scarecrow. Obviously, you've got the main ones. Frank Gorshin as, as the Riddler was absolutely iconic. And it's great. And... and they still influence some of the films in 1989, 92, Quite. so on and so on. There was always little nods back to the series, which shows how um, how much it had permeated culture. Mm. Very much so. So let's get into the 80s. This is Tim Burton's Batman. <laughs> From the sewers of Gotham, a new villain emerges. You didn't invite me, so I crashed! From the roof.
Vicki Vale. Bruce Wayne. And what do you do for a living? <laughs> Lieutenant, is there a six foot bat in Gotham City? Nice outfit. I didn't ask. I have given a name to my pain. What are you? I'm Batman. Did he get those wonderful toys? My life is really ah! complex. Terrorizes. Wait till they get a load of me. <laughs> wow. I mean, I remember, I mean, that year when Batman was, you know, we took over the summer of 1989, Warner Brothers went to town with um, the marketing. He was everywhere. And we'll just, you know, yeah. keep it short because this is not a marketing of Batman. It's just a movie itself. But I remember vividly, we were looking forward to it. Uh, there was documentary galore. We saw snippets of the 1966 uh, version. But for me, we saw what was happening in America where people were getting dressed and people dressed in Batman and Joke and so on. They were, you know, literally, yeah. um, you know, going to the movies. So... Of course, with my friends, we thought, let's do that. Let's get dressed. So off we went. Well, there were six or seven friends, and we all decided to get dressed. When I arrived, guess what? There was only you. There was me and my friend Dominic dressed as a Joker. <laughs> and the whole cinema was sitting no, So it wasn't embarrassing at all, uh, as you can imagine. We even had the, the, the white face and the lipstick yeah. and everything. We actually were, nearly didn't get in because the man said, I don't want that makeup on my, on my seats because these were the cinemas with the plush seats and so on. And... You know, all I wanted to see at the time, I mean, I would have been 20, I wanted to see the Batmobile and I wanted to see Jack Nicholson as the Joker. Yeah, it, it changed everything. And this as well, coming off the back of a 20-year hiatus without this character being on the screen and the last iteration being the Adam West Batman and being the tone of that show, this was entirely different and and that was the point obviously tim burton the master of gothic cinema anyway but just being able to pull jack nicholson the, the an actor of his caliber but also um the type of roles that he plays to pull him into what was a comic book franchise um but bearing in mind at the time comic book films didn't really work. They weren't huge. They weren't like the MCU that we know mm. of. They weren't like the DCU now, where anybody and everybody wants to be in those movies. It was a coup to get somebody like Jack Nicholson in this. Um, Michael Keaton was still relatively, not an unknown, but he was a low key. He wasn't you know, the Michael Keaton that everybody knows at the time. Not at all. If I was doing mostly comedy and yeah. the, the, the pure fans did complain. I mean, back then you couldn't go on social media, but there was suddenly enough noise out there for people to actually release trailers earlier to reassure people that Michael Kinton could pull this off. Yeah, uh, I mean, he, he was an actor and they wanted an actor in the role, but certainly from the purist's view um, of... Uh, Batman's stature, his size, mm. how he looks. Um, Burt Ward, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, uh, Adam West, was more Batman than Michael Keaton. He, he's not right for the part. But it just shows, you know, the, the, the vision that Tim Burton had, the tone of the movie, the look of the Batsuit, which was absolutely, couldn't get, you know, pulls apart from mm. what had been before. And obviously the quality of Keaton's acting was going to be so different, but the only barometer anybody had was what had gone previously. And it just it just broke the mould, completely mm. and utterly broke the mould. It was dark, gothic, <coughs> violent, and everything that Batman had been in, in comics, but not on screen. Mm. So the reason why I want to spend a, a, a bit longer on the 1989 ones, because to your point, it probably set 
the the tone and the foundation for everything that for came everything. after because yeah. as a reminder people you know have been waiting since 1966 to see their hero on the big screen again so so the marketing machine was second to none i mean there was literally batman yo-yos you could buy with batman beanies batman t-shirts you know everything they even went to town warner brothers could because as part of their roster of artists they had prince who was obviously still under contract there and i can show you as one of the many things the prince album i'm just going to quickly switch that off there and as you can see same symbol so the marketing machine has been working and we had the bat dance doing number one around the world yeah, as yeah. well as party yeah. man uh, um, so, yeah trust as well was a big song yeah, off the, off right. the album and so for me not only that but because i'm a huge prince fan fanatic <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm gonna see the batmobile i'm gonna hear that prince songs on the big screen i'm gonna see jack nicholson and well, you know, of course, it was Kim Bessinger, which is um, very nice as well. Mm -hmm. it, it had everything. This film, I mean, mm. the the design that has gone into it. It's very dark. It's very gothic, um, and some would say a little bit hammy, a little bit cartoony. But bearing in mind the previous had been the sixties one, it was it was not hammy. It is now. It wasn't then. Mm -hmm. um, but the design of the Batmobile still. Everything people look at this Batmobile and go, yeah, that's well, that's the one. The design of, of the Bat sign, mm. what, what Pascal's just shown on, on the album and on the poster, was just beautiful. Everything about it, everything, every intricate detail was designed to be visually appealing. The Bat suit was just, you couldn't take your eyes off it. And it's hard, I would imagine, for you guys that have seen so many iterations of this now, to understand how beautifully original and unique this was at the time. Absolutely. I absolutely adored, we did, you know, the the rendering of the city and the way in which, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was re yeah. reproduced re using different te technologies from uh, kind of real physical um, sets all the way to the early days of, of CGs. What I loved about this as well is that the story, so you had really clearly... A, um, a character of uh, Bruce Wayne who you know was challenging himself. He was obviously uh, looking at ways in which he could be a better person, but yeah. still seeking revenge. The story, and actually the origin story, <coughs> excuse me, of the Joker is reasonably well, it, you know, it, rendered. Well so Jack Nicholson yeah. doesn't suddenly become a complete loony, and uh, we don't know where, where it's come from. So there was a lot that they packed in in, yeah. in, the, in the space of two hours, I would say. Uh, yeah, and I mean, the movies have been very clever over the years of not just highlighting a particular Batman villain, but, you know, the Joker has been done more than once a few times now, but they seem to pick a Joker from a different era of comics, and, you know, um, Napier, Jack Nicholson's Joker character, is styled from a particular era of the Joker from the comics, and I think that was great for fans as well. Mm -hmm. Um Jared Leto's Joker is is from a different era. Certainly, um, Joaquin Phoenix's is different. Um, Heath Ledger, the 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 powerhouse performance. It they're from different eras of comics drawn by different artists, and they all have certain looks. And uh, Nicholson's um, being the kind of gangster mm. era just suited the tone, and he pulled it off so well. Some of those lines. Are still used today in kind of popular culture. Like, where does he get those toys? You know, it, <laughs> those lines that yeah. he pulled off were so cool at the time, but have just stuck. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. So luckily and happily, the fans didn't have to wait much longer because three years later, we had the second... 92? 92. 92? We had <gasps> the second Tim Burton movie. From the sewers of Gotham, a new villain emerges. You didn't invite me, so I crashed! From the rooftops of Gotham, the perfect enemy comes to life. Oh. 
Virginia. <laughs> and the only one who can save this city is a creature of the night. Hey, stud. Oh, we had something together. We do. <laughs> While she craves a romance, she can sink her claws into. You can't a girl like me. He plots a foul reign of destruction. My dear penguins, thanks to Batman, the time has come to punish all of Batman! I mean, just the music, the score. I mean, that 92 it's Batman. Just so I was in England then, because 89 was actually, it was still in France. 92 was in England. So that had the movies, and um, oh my goodness. Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, Tim Burton carried on his gothic spectacle. And yes, it's way dark in tone, and it is quite violent, and there's a, there's a lot of adult themes. It's not necessarily kid-friendly. Um, but there is homage to the old one with i mean how ridiculous can you get you know penguins with missiles on the back it's it's still silly in in certain ways but in tone it's very mm. adult and very dark um which i mean these two films were phenomenal money makers right for for warner brothers um and i, I don't think you know we don't have an idea of the scope of how big these were at the yeah. time especially considering considering you know comic book and superhero movies were dead until these two came out. Yeah, now at the time I was studying in England and working in a video store, that video cassette, because back then everyone, this, you had to have VHS cassette players and yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure that didn't exist. Maybe if you had Laserdisc, but then you could afford not to bother with renting uh, videos. And we literally had several copies and they were gone every day. Yeah. And it was one of those films that was so glorious to look at, mm. visually arresting, um, that people would, you know, rent and rent and rent uh, day after day after day after day and watch it time and time again. The performances, this one, Michael Keaton gets top billing, which he, he mm. didn't with Jack Nicholson in the first one. So, you know, his career just from the first film gets top billing with Michelle Pfeiffer, the wonderful, wonderful Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman. Um perfectly cast uh, completely and again the way i can't think her, of a better her transformation is literally metamorphosis it's just yeah. absolutely wonderful and i love the scene so if you remember she she's basically quite a, a shy retiring um worker i think she's a seamstress or a, yeah. um, a clothes designer and she has a flat with a neon line saying um you know hello there and then when she's transformed through through the cat she comes back and smashes the lines and you know reads hell here yeah. You know, and it's just a little moments like this where a, you have to have the imagination, but you have to have the performance. And Danny DeVito as the penguin, I mean, is sinister, is dirty. And yeah. He's got things going on in his mouth because he's been eating fish and oh, it's just... Uh, it, yeah. It's Again, it's brilliant. And I mean, coming from Burgess Meredith, we've still got the monocle, we've still got the hat and things like that. But, you know, it was a stroke of genius from DeVito and from the director, Tim Burton, to take that, keep elements of it, but make it so desanitized, so grungy, so horrible to watch his portrayal of Oswald mm. Cobblepot. It's foul, but captivating at the same time. It's mm -hmm. Absolutely brilliant. Now, this was part of the problem as well, having... 
um, followed these movies for quite a long time. Warner was making a ridiculous amount of money from these films, but not just from the films, from the merchandising, the toys, um, the tie-ins to McDonald's and their, you know, their Happy Meal toys and things like that. That the the money was rolling in. And Tim Burton actually wanted to make a third film and went in for the meeting with um, Warner. But, you know, the producers and the execs had had some negative feedback that this film was too scary for kids, too dark. Penguin with his black gunk coming out of his mouth was considered, you know, unsavory for the children. Um, And I believe that there was a, a Fox or a CNN kid that was 10 year old that did movie reviews and he was like he was scary and i didn't like it and my friends couldn't watch it so they took a you know a 10 year old's um ideology over the top of the fact that adults loved it and they were making a shed mm. load of money and they decided to take the tone of the next movies back more so to um, the 60s tone and obviously Tim Burton didn't get to make his his trilogy which I you know feel is a real real oh, shame a, a, a real completely. shame and what is interesting is um, you know back to your point about you know yes it is um, you know the intention to get the whole family to enjoy it, but there's a point where a child is just too young I mean the, yep. the 1989 Batman was rated 12 to begin with the aspiration was for this to become a PG rated yes. it actually was given a PG 13 which is essentially saying to parents watch it you know it cannot it could be actually not not suitable for for, for young children and and I think that's when you know ultimately, um, the decision that was taken was to go. Let, let's step back a bit from yep. from from the from the, the darkness. Um, actually, was disappointing for the real fans because this one, when you look at the three characters on on, on the screen there with a the poster, it's all about loss. It's about you know what could have been. It's about obviously seeking um, revenge. You know, a kind of punishment. It's about you know uh, having just justice, but the price of doing it yourself and all yeah. those things for all those three characters it is being kind of explored and as we'll see that's going to go away for about and uh, um, for a while and then come back because yeah. that's that's a very very important theme which is yes batman is given the label of superhero but actually what is uh, driving him and these motivations are which is what makes it so interesting so multifaceted and, and have different dimensions are questionable it, well technically i mean he is an anti-hero mm-hmm. you know he, he he sometimes does you know questionable or the wrong thing for the right reason which you know at the end of the day is much more relatable to adults it isn't a black and white world that we live in uh, there there is gray areas and um it's much more human to have emotive responses or whatever, which is what, you know, Batman does have because of the loss of his parents. And I think the tone of these two films were solely squared in tone and in story um, aimed at adults. Mm. But, you know, the actual visual violence and the things that you saw on screen, kids could engage with, which, you know, we discussed recently about the same thing with Star Wars. The original Star Wars films had adult themes adult tone but had visuals that a kid could engage with where when you do the opposite and you make the tone for children then those children grow up and very quickly grow out of that film but if you do it the other way around a kid growing into an adult can watch the film for the rest of their life and Mm -hmm. that's what's so good about those two particularly is the tone had enough adult themes that you can still watch it now and get something out of it. But if you were a kid at the time and you maybe were a little bit scared, then the idea is that either you don't watch it, the parent makes a decision, or you ask the parent some questions and you learn a little bit about life. You know, that's that's the clever thing about these two movies. Absolutely. So three years later, people dun, 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 went dun. back to the cinemas to see Batman Forever. Riddle me this, riddle me that. Who's afraid of the big black bat? 
In an uncertain world, in a chaotic time, justice wears a mask. to make a pretty lethal combination. Ah! Train me, let me be your partner. Who's your tailor? But first, let's meet our contestants. Going down. If the back wants to play, we'll play. <laughs> Was that over the top? Somewhere too late. You forgot the part where you kiss the girl. The real game begins. Courage now. Truth always. Batman forever. Bam, 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 bam. Wow. I've not seen this pretty much since 1995. Yeah, it. it the, um, you know, so the memories have just been flying back. So my memory is. I was very, very happy with Val Kilmer because I always loved Val Kilmer. And I thought, okay, never mind. It would have been nice to have carried on mm-hmm. with um, the same the same Batman, but, you know, w- w- we'll go with it. Um, but there was a lot going on in that one story. You know, they, they, they plowed everybody, all the villains and the Robin and the bad girl, well, the beginning yeah. of bad girl anyway. So I just remember sitting there thinking, they could have just um, told the story over maybe more than one one film. Yeah, it was a mess of a movie. And yeah, we have the whole fallout of the studio saying, we want to take this tone back to be more kid-friendly and kid-centred um, because we get to sell more toys and we get to sell more merchandise and what have you. So basically, at the time... Um, Jim Carrey was just really, really taken off and he had three kind of hits in one year, Dumb and Dumber, The Mask, um, Ace Ventura, you know what I mean? Mm. And he was the big guy at the time. So they decided, you know, let's get him in as a riddler. Let's make centre the movie around him, essentially. He became the star. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he was allowed even on set to kind of ad lib and riff for 10, 20, 30, <laughs> 40, 100 takes while other people maybe were sidelined a little bit. And I know um, Chris O'Donnell, Robin, spoke about this, um, saying that some people, you know, it rubbed them the wrong way. And I know Tommy Lee Jones um, was being overshadowed quite a lot. And that wasn't necessarily the director's fault. The director, Joel Schumacher, has taken heat for these movies for years because they, you know, were so camp and so flamboyant and hamming it up like the 60s Batman, which, Correct, yeah. you know, bear in mind the world had uh, had been ready for the, the Tim Burton-esque era and got what they wanted. Uh, to, to go back over a lot of the fans' hated it and Joel Schumacher got you know the brunt of that but he the tone was set by the studios and Mm -hmm, the producers mm -hmm. they wanted their money from um marketing and and that's what they wanted so it it was hard I think think it proves proves the point by the relationship and, and and you know um the director on occasion is commissioned 
yeah. to do something as opposed to they come up with a script and they, the storyboard and they pitch for the financiers to you know, literally finance moving, keep out of the yeah. way. On uh, this one, it was a commissioned yeah. um, a bit of work. And so, again, I've not seen Batman Forever for a very, very long time. I reckon I saw it in the 90s. It, it's a tough then, watch. Uh, and then moved on. It's fun. I'd like to watch it again now. But it's a tough watch. Because, um, like I said, I absolutely really, really like Val Kilmer. And um, I reckon that having, with time passing, yeah. I'm probably going to be enjoying it even more. I, I, exactly that point is when you have expectations of what the film should be, bearing in mind the previous two, it's a very difficult watch. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult to watch as you are an adult unless now you look at it from a nostalgic fondness point of view, like you do with the 60s one, and you're happy to laugh at the film for what it is. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Jim Carrey is inspired in every single scene he is. Tommy Lee Jones, it's the first time he'd ever done anything that wasn't really a serious role, and it's nice to see him do that. Nicole Kidman's always great. Chris O'Donnell was great. Val Kilmer is fantastic. There's so many things about the film to enjoy if you just roll with it for what mm-hmm. it is and you're not hankering for what had gone before. No, absolutely. And I think for me, therefore, it's more that it's not through a challenge of having to change the main actor all the time because, you know, they do that with Spider-Man, they do that with so yeah. many other ones. It wasn't the issue. The issue of the tonality is night and day, literally. Um, yes, yeah. Well, just and, made a, a good sentence then, night uh, and day. And, and, that's, and, and that's the thing. I wanted to discuss through this. Um, essentially, we know in in the Marvel universe there is a multiverse. We know mm-hmm. there is Earth six one six, and you know, blah blah blah. They're doing that kind of thing with DCU, and they they have done that in the past. And I think with Michael Keaton now coming back mm. as his version of Batman, um, we've got Ben Affleck's version of Batman. We've also got the new, obviously, Pattinson's version of Batman. I think the best way to think about all of these films, and this may become, you know, canon, um, I don't know, but it's the way I think about them, is they are alternate universes. Mm -hmm. They are alternate Gothams. So we have, you know, the Tim Burton-esque Gotham in one universe on one Earth, and that's how Gotham has turned out, and that's their version of Batman. This... Batman Forever with Val Kilmer and following on the next one with um, Clooney are different universes. They're different Batmans in a different Mm -hmm. universe. And if you treat it like that, like it's the same story being told with different realizations of that story, you can just watch it for what it is. No, absolutely. Well, let's move on to 1997 then. Batman and Robin. My name is Freeze. Learn it well. For it's the chilling sound of your doom. This is the way the world could end. Please, show some mercy. With ice. With a kiss. Mm. With venom. I probably should have mentioned this. I'm poisoned. Poison Ivy. And the only man who can stop them. Hi, Freeze. I'm Batman. Can't do it alone. Batman will watch his beloved Gotham perish. Bundle up, boys. There's a storm coming. Kill the heroes! The hockey team from hell! Cool party! Arnold Schwarzenegger. All right, everyone, chill. George Clooney. I'm not the marrying kind. I know you've had your wild night. Good night. Wild doesn't doesn't quite cover it. Chris O'Donnell. Come join me. My garden needs tending. She loves me and not you, and it's driving you crazy. This is why Superman works alone. Uma Thurman. So many people to kill. So little time. Alicia Silverstone. And you are? Batgirl. That's not awfully PC. What about that person? Found the Batcave. She knows who we are. I guess we just have to kill her. In a Joel Schumacher film. 
Strength and courage. Partners. Honor. Partners. And loyalty. Freedom and justice. Partners. It all comes together. We're going to need a bigger cave. Batman and Robin. So visually it got bigger and it got brighter. Um, definitely the tone shifted even more towards the kids because mm. for all um, Batman Forever seems to be a little bit kind of frowned upon now, at the time it was a big commercial success. So they took the tone even more towards the 60s. Um, and I think it's one of those films that if you had been involved in you would have just had so much fun with. Yeah. I mean, Schwarzenegger was obviously having so much fun, <laughs> hamming it up, throwing out those one-liners. You got the wonderful Uma Thurman playing Poison Ivy, who's one of my favorite actresses, but favorite characters, yeah, favorite yeah. villains from the from the Batman era as well. Um, and the only shame about both of these films, especially this one, is Batman became marginalized by the bad guys. Um, George Clooney never had a chance to really be an amazing Batman because the the story didn't allow him to be and the film itself didn't allow him to be. And I love George Clooney, um, but Val Kilmer was marginalised, George Clooney was marginalised mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the villains became almost more important than than the Batman in these two films. Well, quite, and in the way which, once again, was marketed, was all about the villains. It's, it's a bit like what you were saying, you know, what a coup to get Jack Nicholson in 89. And it was almost like, well, what can we do now? Well, let's get Schwarzenegger, yep. let's get, you know, Uma Thurman, let's get all, all the others. And, and so for me, and back to um, back to where I was saying, I love all the actors who played Batman. I, I have no issue yeah. whatsoever with them. In fact, you know, uh, why not? Um, that could be part of the way in which the universe is being explored. But it's back to this idea of do you, do you have to pile all this in? So you know, this was obviously called um, Batman and and, and Robin. Robin. So let's explore that. Let's explore the tension. Let's explore how Robin is, is has his own journey. Is also a seeking solace, and he's being let down by Batman. That's a wonderful story to explore. Then there's no need to suddenly add more villain and, and more um, what what they did. Or you take your time with the story. Then you don't rush it. And yeah. this was a rush production. And Joel Schumacher was very outspoken to say they gave me literally six months to film. If if that. And then it has to be turned around quickly to be the summer blockbuster to make more money. And, yep. you know, if we'd spend maybe longer on the script to begin with, longer on the filming, but also then all maybe should have been a two-parter. And then you can really, really take your time. And the, the one issue that I have with movies when they rush like this is how they film and their use of light. And uh, this was essentially, as people saw from the trailer, which again, is, it sounds like a criticism, but it's more to do with the idea of, because I much prefer the 1989 and, and 1992, yeah. I felt I was inside the nightclub all the time. Yeah, you know? uh, it had it, become massively neon, hadn't mm, it? Everything yeah. about it was neon. The Batcar was lit up neon. And, you know, the, the, the Batmobile in the first two 89 and 92 were amazing and, and dark and sleek and almost like a dragster. And um, these just looked plastic with holes in them with, with neon lights underneath and these big wings at the back that wobbled when it mm. rode. And uh, you, you couldn't take it seriously. And that's the problem is, is the tone. Um, you know, you were splitting your audience between the people that had watched the two before and loved it, the the adults, trying to love um, the next iteration, but really the, the only people could love it was, was yeah. the smaller kids. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm trying tough. to remember because um, <laughs> it's a long time ago um, and clearly it must be a, a sign that I've not bothered watching them again. Yeah. But my memory is like you, which is Poison Ivy kind of really stood out. She was great, and yeah. And the storyline and how she became and what she did and so on. I, I, I did think that the story of Mr. Freeze was interesting. It's with about his loss wife, again. yeah. It's about loss again and how, uh, you know, pain and, and, and heartache can really uh, take people on, on a different journey altogether. So you've got all that going on, but then it's 
little almost um, overshadowed, but it's a wrong term, by all oh, this bright light and all this yeah. all this stuff. And it, it they, they, they just ham it up. Mm. Um, oh, let's shove Batgirl in there, and let's let's shove this with Robin in there, mm. and let, let's like you know Batman will be around in the background somewhere. But yeah, it was too busy, too much. Yeah, not written well enough, not executed well enough because you know they didn't have the time to do that. Um, the the sets, as you could see from you know the 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 ice hockey people, mm. um, didn't look particularly great. Uh, so it 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 had. It had a lot of problems, and obviously it was a nail in the coffin lid for Batman on the big screen for a lot of years. Um, oh, absolutely. So, you know, I mean, if you just, you know, just to close on that, look at the poster design compared to what we've seen in previous years. It feels like, you know, the who's who almost of, um, yep. just in case, you know, you, you, you're worried about Batman and Robin, let us show you everybody and everything that we, we, we're going to include in there. And and I think you could have halved, you know, the um, the characters well, and the storyline, and still end up with a very good film. It's that whole thing about um, more is better mm-hmm. when you know always less is more. Um, concentrate, get your story right, get your characters right, and then flesh that out, and you've got a good shot of making something decent. But just by by adding more, 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 more people, more, 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 more bright lights, more, more, more bangs, explosions, doesn't necessarily make a good movie. And in 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 fairness, Jim Carrey's role was so good, so over the top and so big, but he was at the height mm. of his career at the time and he was super popular. Um, people coming next were like, well, how do we make it bigger than Jim Carrey? You know, so the, what was amazing in Batman Forever almost caused a problem with with what they did to follow it up so on one hand though it's great to have yet another batman movie to uh, to go back to and and be part of what we do so but you're right fans then had to wait a while because i think studios had to go away and lick their wounds a little fans had to to settle so in the meantime people like you in particular had lots of graphic novels and and books to kind of uh, go back to I know you kind of brought with you some of uh, yeah. what you have in your bat cave. So what, have you, what kind of goodies <laughs> have you brought with you today? Because I'm educated and I can read, <laughs> unlike some people, um, I've always followed the comics. And I, as I got older, I just didn't buy, you know, the Batman comic every week. I just picked, cherry picked the ones I loved. But there's some absolute classics out there. And one of the big ones for me that's been very, very iconic, and came into um, the later films. This is the book version of it, not the graphic novel version. It was was Batman Nightfall, one of the greatest stories where they introduced Bane as a supervillain that wasn't just a henchman like Jeep Swanson in um, Batman Forever, I think it was. Um, He was an absolute genius supervillain in his own right that broke into Arkham Asylum let out all of the the crazies, all of Batman's usual villains, so that he ran himself ragged trying to round up all of these villains. And when he was at his weakest, Bane destroys him and breaks his back. And Batman has to come back from that to not only defeat Bane, but also defeat Batman's replacement that has basically lost the plot and is killing people. And it's just the best Batman story. And if the just made that it would have been an amazing movie so that's one um arkham asylum is one of the seminal batman novels of all time i've, I've played the video game does that yep. count yes it does it <laughs> no. um killing joke no uh, that one by alan moore changed the way comics were perceived and it, it brought adults back to uh comics i've got a few little listed here so the dark knight returns was one of the biggies where he mm-hmm. actually first defeats superman which you know has come into some of the things later on year one and year two they're highly influential to the new batman with robert patterson yeah you've got killing joke Arkham asylum nightfall the court of owls was very popular hush long halloween and one of my favorites was death in the family where actually they killed off robin which was huge which you was can't huge like at that the time. Without it, warning me. Yeah, it was, you know, well, that was it. Nobody saw it coming. Um, but on top of that, I actually love where they take a popular character like Batman, mm-hmm. 
but let him deal with something that has nothing to do with Gotham villains. So what about Batman versus Aliens? Okay. I mean, how cool would that be as a movie? Um, Batman versus Judge Dredd. Talking about moving between different universes. Batman and Judge Dredd. And in this one, you've got the four dark judges as well. Fear, Fire, Mortis and Death that come through to, you know, Batman's Gotham and start killing everybody. That's really cool. Batman versus Spawn. One and two. I love especially that one. The artwork in that one is mm. phenomenal. But here it comes. This is probably my favorite Batman crossover. Batman versus Predator. Now, that's a movie I would pay to see. Well, absolutely. There you go. Nice. No, uh, so it just shows about the character. It shows about um, what you know, artists, so storytellers can do yep. to really get an audience because between, obviously, you know, that and Batman Begins we're going to get on to, there were so many attempts to get the studio to listen to, for example, Batman Year One was pitched several times. Yeah. Uh, people looking, well, look at the work from Frank Miller. You know, we're going to get it right with uh, Batman Alan Dark Moore, Knight. Frank Miller. Nightfall was, was mentioned. People said, how about a Robin spin-off? So there was so many attempts and... The studios were still thinking, yeah, we're not sure anymore because I, th yeah. I suppose, rightly so, they kind of, um, you know, it ate some humble pie, realizing we can't always get it right. And it took quite a bit of time. It took yet again another visionary, and we had to then wait till Was 2005. 2005. death was not your fault. My parents deserve justice. I cannot let that pass. If you make yourself more than just a man, then you become something else entirely. Which is a legend, Mr. Wayne. Master Wayne, are you coming back for long, sir? As long as it takes to show the people of Gotham their city doesn't belong to the criminals and the corrupt. Bruce? Rachel? You were gone a long time. I know. Things are worse than ever down here. What chance does Gotham have when the good people do nothing? No make survival suit for advanced infantry. Kevlar law utility harness, gas-powered magnetic grapple gun. What's that? On the tumbler? Oh, you wouldn't be interested in that. I spent a lot of time being scared for you. I heard you were back. But the man I loved. The man who vanished never came back. He's here. Who? The Batman. This was yet another big reset. So you'll see from 60s camp to dark and gritty, it went back to 60s camp. And this is the second time they had to reset the universe, bring it back for the yeah. for, for a more different toned audience. And wow. I just remembered we went together to see it. Yes, we did. We did. Yeah, that was the first Batman over the, the series we've watched since so far that we saw together. It felt a very special one because we also knew some of the uh, stunt yeah. 
people that were working and we, they shared some stories with us. And I would agree with you. It was almost like, well, it was the first one as well where I had friends and even business acquaintances who went to see a Batman movie that or I would say it didn't feel embarrassing the same way you'd seen Batman yeah. and Robin and you kind of go, you want to see what, you know? Yeah. You, you, did you take your kids? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, I mean, they took um, Batman and brought it into a world that was something we could recognize. Mm, they set mm. the tone of this in a way that had never, ever been done. Christopher Nolan set it in a city in a world that looked like one we had been to or could visit. Yeah, it yeah. was kind of like New York, Chicago kind of a city. Um, Gotham was something you could reach out and touch for the first time on mm. screen. And that set the tone of this being a much more grounded, much more realistic style of Batman. Again, they humanized the character, not just in story, but in the visual medium used everything in it was plausible the the tumbler the new batmobile mm. was half tank half car they built it for real it could drive it's plausible you know we could see that it's not some neon lit up car that can climb up the side of a building what it did it could happen the the gas powered grappling hook i could see how that could work they mm. they made it tangible and that's what really resonated with wider audiences. Absolutely. You still have the theme of loss, of redemption, of revenge, yep. of um, trying to actually do good, but actually how do you do that without necessarily being uh, the bad guy? In, and in crossing the, the line. And crossing the line. How? Where are your allies, real ones, compared to... Um, and I think for me, what was also um, very interesting about this one, it was the first one really that spent time on the screen fighting properly. Yep. Now, you could say Pascal is 2005. Of course, they're going to get it right. Well, actually, absolutely. They could have got it right in the 80s and the 90s yes. before because there was uh, countless martial arts and action movies where people knew how to move. Well. They knew how to sell a, um, a hit. And this was the one where I went, oh, hang on a minute. So this, this feels very plausible again very kinetic in terms of how they're moving also the style of fighting seemed interesting but also very realistic for somebody in that kind of suit mm. um talking about that some of the audience may not know that steven seagal was on the top of the list to be in the 1989 batman wow he the, he um was the one that they were trying to court to to do that and he chose to do um, above the law, but also the studios kind of were unsure because he didn't have any proven acting skills mm -hmm. and, and, and went w with Keaton. But if he could have pulled off um, martial arts action scenes then. So, yeah, it can be done, but it was often done badly to highlight your point. Yeah. But in um, Batman Begins, it was done exceptionally well, mm -hmm. especially, again, realistic to the, to the suit he wears and the way he has to move. Um, and for me, there was a real reward to have taken the trouble to go to the movies because this was filmed for the big screen, was constructed yep. to be enjoyed from the natural landscapes all the way to the cityscapes. The sound, the, the sound, the design. music, and 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 it was almost like you know this this almost guilty pleasure of getting the returning to the Batcave we're seeing it very, very differently. Yeah. Returning to Gotham City, returning to the scenes that we've all seen on the boardrooms, the, the evening do, you know, the, how, and everything w was kind of explored, but, but also starting with a actually very flawed and very weak character. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously we, we haven't mentioned Christian Bale, who is a powerhouse of an actor, you know, to, to have him play... Batman, who is arguably a tortured character, and it's the first film where you really see that um, Batman isn't, or had previously been, a billionaire playboy playing the Batman. This was where they switched, where actually Bruce Wayne really is Batman playing to be a billionaire playboy. Mm -hmm. That's the fake Bruce Wayne. And this switch, that which makes the whole film different. You know, the character he plays is Bruce Wayne. The real person is who's in the mask. And that comes across as well. And, you know, this universe of Batman, this particular one with, with real characters and real people and real um, cities uh, resonated massively. I mean, it, yeah. it, it was so, huge. Case in point, people... I'm, I'm, 
I can't remember this. This is true or false memory. Whether we knew there was a trilogy or we were hoping there'd be a, another one, but like I said, friends, people that don't really bother with superhero movies love this one, and importantly, we're looking for what was coming next. Can I quickly mention the importance in terms of them, the character journey, and of course, you know who they interact with, the importance of Alfred. I was yeah, I was just going to say the talent mm-hmm. attached to this. So Alfred's you know super important to Batman all the way through with Michael Goff in mm-hmm. the nineteen eighty. 1980- 89 ones and um you you've got the mighty michael kane who is you know eating he's a megastar of and been around forever if you were to literally you know transcribe all everything he says across the trilogy of the character of alfred michael kane the wisdom and and the love and affection that he has uh, and we'll see it in a moment so i think it, it's something because uh, we reacted we know when we saw the the trailer from batman and robin the last one and that was a fraction of a second of michael goff and yeah. we realized, oh my god that was the last time we saw the actor in yep. in that franchise but also was also the reminder of the importance of listen the mental figure as part of the the, the kind of uh, storytelling and that's probably what on occasion people miss i mean look at the other talent um gary oldman mm. as commissioner gordon uh liam neeson and ken watanabe all there uh, yeah, yeah, yeah you know the the talent in this film every single one of them can carry a huge movie on their own and to put them into a film with a good enough story where none of it overshadows the real journey of mm-hmm. christian bale's bruce wayne they are there as window dressing to carry that story is is a testament to Christopher Nolan. Um, it, it it did the exact opposite to what they'd done for the last two. Absolutely. <coughs> so we had to wait three years for the next one. You've changed things. There's no going back. See, to them, you're just a freak. Like me. (laughs) What do we got? Nothing. No name, no other alias. Clothing is custom. Nothing in his pockets but knives and lint. Evening, Commissioner. Why so serious? Where is he? People are dying. What would you have me do? Endure. You can be the outcast. You can make the choice that no one else will face. The right choice. Gotham needs you. A little fight in you. I like that. And you're gonna love me. Now that's more like it, Mr. Wayne. <laughs> it's all part of the plan. Come on, hit me! Let's put a smile on that face. (laughs) Bang. This is the one. This is the one that will arguably be many people's greatest Batman movie of all time. How can you top Batman Begins? Uh... Wow, that was it. That uh, was it. Yeah, and was the one. this is the one that, that made everybody, no, mind, no matter their, their likes and dislikes and preferences, to actually appreciate what would be deemed to be a superhero movie, therefore I'm out. And suddenly they go, now this is a superb movie. Yeah. This is a superb movie. And I got chills watching Heath Ledger again um, because, you know, this is exactly how you go about telling the story, but using the villains to actually highlight 
what the main character is going through. You know, it's not what they've done in the past, which is the villain <coughs> becomes the the star of the show in a bizarre way. Yeah, you know, and now honestly, the the, the Dark Knight well won obviously all the the um, the praises and the awards that that it deserved. But it was also um, what people were saying, saying it was such an experience to be at the cinema once again to watch something just unravel. And frankly, you didn't know what was going to come next. Yeah, you, you didn't know where it was going to go. It, it was visually arresting, stunning from start to finish. And mm-hmm. it's one of those films where Christian Bale is an amazing actor, but there's not many times you can put people on screen that take your eye away from him Mm. and Heath Ledger absolute every single second he is on screen you are captivated captivated from start to finish his portrayal of the Joker had never ever been done like that before um, in comics in cartoons or on film and for the first time he played essentially some serial killer some psychopath that we don't even know his background and that was never explained, which is even more genius. Even it it makes you want to know more about the character that comes out of nowhere and leaves this trail of destruction that everybody's trying to pick up the pieces for. And the thing is the, 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 for the first time he's doing it for the reasons that the audience can agree with. Mm. And Batman arguably is doing the wrong thing by protecting some of the villains because of the system or protecting or holding up a corrupt system, whereas Heath Ledger's Joker literally is highlighting that the system is broken and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it down. And in some ways, he becomes more the anti-hero stroke hero than yeah, Batman yeah, is himself, yeah, yeah. and that's genius. Completely. I just put the post on screen because that, when I was out on bus stops and side of buses and everywhere, buildings, wasn't it? It was everywhere. It was just absolutely stunning. The artwork and and the excitement because you know we saw the trailer, we saw the teasers, saw the interviews. I'm thinking, I feel like once again I'm going to be well looked after as a moviegoer and and as a fan. And this is like I said, the one where. Everybody talked about it. Everybody said they enjoyed it, even though they would say to me, I would not normally go and see a film like that. Yeah. Like, um, because I don't, or because I think it's silly or it's for kids, but this one was definitely it, for adults. It wasn't a superhero story. It was mm. a crime story mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with superheroes in. And that's the thing. Everybody can relate to a good crime story that is is real and well-written. Um, and... W- Correct me if I'm wrong. Was Aaron Eckhart introduced in this one as Two Face? That's as right. Harvey well, Dent. He, yeah. And then eventually, yeah. Yeah, yeah and yeah. the way they introduced him as a character and fleshed him out mm-hmm. through didn't overshadow Joker, didn't overshadow Batman, but he was there. So there was lovely little kind of teasers to what could come next, Quite where true. that character could go. Um, other villains from the franchise, but without just ramming it in your face and spoiling the story. It was executed sublimely mm-hmm. just quick uh, reference to marketing because roger and i reviewed this film as in the marketing campaign a couple of things they did were uh, in comic book stores they were dropping jokers cards on the floor on purpose for the fans to go, go crazy and pick them up they also had a um, fake election online so you could vote for um erin Cart online and make it the mayor so actually you as a movie goer made him become you know the mayor thanks to your votes and so on so there was also a, um, you know, a life of Gotham City outside of, of the film, which was very, very clever. Very quickly before we move on to the third and final part of this um, trilogy, for me, what what The Dark Knight um, has done is, is proving the point about when you have someone like Chris Nolan and when you have, obviously, the actors and the world that has been well-defined, the role of the producers, and you, you could see there was quite a few logos at the beginning, the role of the producers is to actually help somebody make it happen yeah not necessarily get in the way it, and it's, create more obstacles. it's to get out of the way yeah absolutely, yeah absolutely so we had to be just a bit more patient for in a final one we had to wait four years to 2012 You are as precious to me 
as you were to your own mother and father. I swore to them that I would protect you, and I haven't. The mayor's gonna dump him in the spring. Really? Mm-hmm. But he's a hero, a war hero. This is peacetime. You think this can last? There's a storm coming, Mr. Wayne. You and your friends better batten down the hatches. Because when it hits, you're all going to wonder how you ever thought you could live so large and leave so little for the rest of us. What does that mean? Rise. When Gotham is ashes, you have my permission to die. we have it the third part of the amazing christopher nolan batman trilogy yeah do you know i remember the feeling of the movies it was so somber it was so sad you know you 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 were carried by the the emotions and you were thinking this is almost like an impossible task you know how are they going to solve this so once again like the the previous one you just didn't know the first first time you watch it you sit through there you just don't know where this is going it it and that's the thing. It's how do you top the the <laughs> one before, and it it it's impossible because it was so good and so well received. And obviously, you know Heath Ledger, um, what went on with with him afterwards, and him be, be being given a posthumous Oscar for his portrayal, and rightly so that you know it was that good. There is no way you can top that. So Nolan and the um, team did the right thing in they just told the story they wanted to tell and didn't mm. try to kind of deliberately one-up the previous film. They just carried on with the story, Bruce Wayne's character arc, his journey with you know the next um, villain he's got to deal with. And at this point in time, Bruce is broken he's a broken man he's he's physically broken from his endeavors mm. over the time and mentally broken too as there's hints of nightfall in this and um it's his redemption or how he's going to redeem himself but also the the character of um the vigilante the batman in dealing with the next disaster in gotham and in a lot of ways I, when i watched it 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 yeah, it's not as good as the last one. You know, when mm, when I went to mm. the pictures, it's good, but it's not as good as the last one. But it never could be. But actually, I go back to watch that one way more than I watch Batman Begins. I would imagine so, yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it does stand up as a film of, it, of itself. We've got the mighty Tom Hardy mm-hmm. as Bane, who, you know, is masked all the way through and has this very, very strange voice in it that at first people seem to to hate on, right? I remember a big yeah, online thing. Me, but yeah, yeah, yeah. about because he wasn't, ur, ur, you know, the big ur, being, being deep voiced. He had quite a an odd voice to it, which now, once you've got over that, makes it better, way more yeah. interesting, mm-hmm. way more interesting. Um, Marianne Cotillard. Mm-hmm. She's amazing in every scene she's in. Um, Anne Hathaway is just perfectly cast as Catwoman. And, you know, arguably, how can you top Michelle Pfeiffer, who was perfect? They didn't top it, but they found somebody that could bring it into the new generation. And 
Anne Hathaway was amazing. And in a way, I'm kind of sad that she never got a chance to reprise the the role in a spin-off or yeah, yeah, yeah. again in another film because she was so good and there was there was legs there for it right there was and because to your point you know the, the those villains that people know even if they're not batman fans catwoman's a tough one to get right yes you know, because you could go it could go either way and, and i think she did an, a sterling job and I, I would agree oh if only could explore her story or, or whatever because mm. the character was well written as well mm. her portrayal was amazing and you know arguably she's a beautiful lady playing the part of Catwoman. you know it, it could have just been that it could have just mm -hmm. been window mm -hmm. dressing but she was a real character in that like batman she's kind of an anti-hero yes she does the wrong thing but at the same time she's not overtly bad she's not evil so you know there's a lot of play between those two characters there where she could get up to mischief but you could still like her yeah. in, in 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 her own projects and it was so well written you you kind of couldn't not like her as well it was brilliant and for me my memory of being at the movies again seeing this and then watching it again after that on blu-ray is michael kane I think this was yeah. the chapter in the trilogy where, again, his role is to bring all the realities and all the things that either Bruce Wayne has chosen to ignore or just simply missed completely. And he was there at all times delivering every single word. That there was nothing wasted in the script writing, you know? Yeah. He is the anchor mm. to Bruce Wayne. When Bruce Wayne or Batman um, can't handle things anymore the one thing in his life that is always there and always solid and always dependable and always the focal point to which every, everything works around is Alfred. Mm. And Michael Caine personifies that in these films. Um, when Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne has locked himself away for weeks and months at a time, he knows, the one thing that he does know is that if he sticks his nose out of the door, Alfred will be pottering about somewhere, mm -hmm. still making sure that he's okay, even though they haven't seen each other for three weeks, <laughs> you know, and that that's, that comes across, that kind of love and care yeah, just within the wonderful. film. Because you have to have those dimensions in the story, otherwise it's just too much or it's lacking, you know, in, in the experience. So, listen, as fans, you know, we were well served, you know, up to that point we had, uh, well, we had also the TV series, the animation, the Lego movie, we had, um, you know, the spin-offs with... Um, Gotham, the TV show, which was all, really yeah, cool. You're right, you had all that. So, we, we I was happy to leave it there and then 2018 there's a murmur mm. <laughs> there's a rumble there's a disturbance in the force 2020 it's confirmed are they going to go ahead with um a batman movie not much is is is, um, is shared a, a year later a bit more is shared and literally it was um last autumn winter we had the, the first trailer originally though just before we go into this it was going to be an affleck movie mm -hmm. directed by ben affleck him playing Batman, and it was going to follow certain um, comic tropes as as Batman is getting older. And I, in some ways, would have liked to have seen it. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen what he did with it. But we got something very different when um, Ben stepped away. And to be fair, it's damn good. <laughs> Oh, take it easy, sweetheart. 
guy. Hear everything they say, ain't you? Maybe we're not so different. Who are you under there? I'm vengeance. Well, I've seen that, so I'll let you start. Well, listen, I didn't need another Batman movie, but I need to see this. <laughs> it's just like, um, I've watched this trailer 10 times, and the reason why I'm watching it 10, I've watched it 10 times because I love the videography. I, I just want to freeze frame, press print, and have it on a big frame because yeah. there are some moments in there that are outstanding. So what do I love about the trailer? Because you've seen the film, obviously, without me, just not people. <laughs> So the music, uh, I get kind of yeah. literally um, Gus Ping Paul. Uh, I love the way it looks. I love the way um, it's fighting, but actually the way it's revealed by the lack of light of the light. There's a scene where, because I've seen so many times where people are using machine guns, it's the flare from the, um, yeah. from the from the gun that is showing what's, what's happening. It's almost like the Darth Vader scene from Rogue One, yes. but done in, in its own way. Um, I was very <laughs> happy once you know the news had been shared. I was very happy with um, Robert Pattinson, not Richard. I don't know who Richard Pattinson is, the guy that I mentioned to you, to you for days on end. And then kind of thought, who is he talking he's got, about? He's, he's got the butchers around the corner, I believe. <laughs> and the, um, you know, I just thought he would, he would be absolutely fine because my view was that you have to trust the director, you know. And now when I heard it was Matt Reeves, I said, well, where do you know Matt Reeves from? And then, of course, IMDb. Cloverfield, Dawn and Wolf, Planet of the Apes, and so many more. I'm thinking, mm, this could get very interesting. Yeah. But again, no need for a new Batman movie. But once you see something like this, so 10 years later, am I right in thinking that it is yet another reset? And <coughs> as fans, let, let, let's go along and, and we'll see where the story takes it's, us. It's a reset stroke. It's a, it's a different universe. It's Batman in a different universe, and it's beautifully realized. So, okay, we've got campy 60s Batman. Then we've got gothic Batman. Then we've got neon Batman, mm -hmm. and then you've got ultra-real Batman. Where this one sits is a cross between the Gotham TV show, yeah. grittiness, urban... And Christopher Nolan's ultra real. It sits probably in between. It's a very, very noir mm. visual look where it is a city that we kind of recognize across between kind of New York's Times Square, um, Blade Runner esque kind of look. But as soon as you walk around the corner, it, it, it's kind of a dirty down and grungy version of Chicago Stroke. Um, New York, um, and it's just beautifully realised everything about it. But it has the tone in some ways of of almost like a sixties tie in. Mm. You know, the car, the muscle car, isn't fancy. The motorbikes that they use are more retro in it. So it it sits in its own little visual universe that works it is real you mm -hmm. can reach out and touch it it's almost like a city you could you could visit but not hyper real like christopher nolan it's it has that slight fantastic element to it now what i absolutely loved apart from the visuals apart from this story there um oh sorry the actors and actresses in it which i think were just sublimely cast is they went back for the first time and told 
a whodunit story with yeah, Batman. Yeah, yeah. It's based around the original detective comics where Batman essentially was highly influenced by Sherlock Holmes and Zorro, where uh, um, the Phantom and... Um, is it the Spirit? Yep. No, the Shadow. The, the Shadow, shadow sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Highly influenced by these characters where basically he has to solve a crime and he's so smart like Sherlock Holmes, he's ahead of the police and that's what you see on screen here. Mm. So Nolan's were crime stories, um, like organised crime stories, not a whodunit. Um, before that, we had big supervillain versus super Batman stories. Um, the 60s TV show, every single show was a whodunit. Yeah, you had to yeah. work out who the bad guy Find was and, and, and what and they were doing. Because, uh, I mean, certainly the, the character, not only, obviously, he's got that physical prowess and knows every single martial arts uh, kind of going under the sun, but higher IQ, and which is where, obviously, the, the myth of the fear comes from. Yep. Interrogation <clears throat> techniques and, and kind of it's almost like um, the lie to me. Psychology. Yeah, it's, yeah, absolutely. He, he uses psychology against the villains and... In this, they've reset Batman to to a younger version in this in this world sure. in mm -hmm. this world. So he's a younger version. Essentially, he's a little bit emo. He's a little bit kind of teen angst. In that, as he's not quite an adult yet, he's on the verge of adulthood. So mm -hmm. I, it hasn't really nailed down what his age should be. But you know, you imagine somebody with the mental kind of fortitude of eighteen to twenty four year old who has gone through the death of his parents, yeah, you know, he's yeah, supposedly yeah. now the head of Wayne Industries. He can't cope with it. He's in this city that's, you know, a cesspool of crime. And um, he's also, it, it's it's essentially set in year two of Batman's yeah. life. He's had two years of working the streets by night, so he's not really sleeping either. So he's kind of a shell of a of a young man that can't cope with the reality of what he's living through. Mm -hmm. um, and all he's living for is vengeance. And every criminal or nerd well that he comes up against is the absolute personification of the people that, the type of person that killed his parents. So that's how he's treating everybody yeah. and the world. And this is the first time you actually see a fractured relationship between him and Alfred too. Right, and that's very mm. interesting. And because there, there were elements in the trilogy, but it was always rescued because one or the other they did reconcile. But I would imagine because of the age, because of the angst, and so yes, on, that, that you, you would have that, that dimension. Um, I mean, I know you've offered very kindly to go back a second time with me. So sure, by, by and a third. End, <laughs> by the end of this show, we'll organize a, a day. Because do you know, I was looking at. I mean, I've seen the trailer so many times. The um the videography reminds me a lot of um, Seven. You know when they don't yeah. they're not afraid to go right in. They're not afraid to frame actually very very differently as well, or to have literally the, the scene where the penguin is is driving away and literally it's offset. So you can see what's going on in the, yeah. in the background. It's almost breaking kind of symmetrical rules, but you know, it's done on on purpose. So again, I like when something feels thoughtful yeah. in terms of how it's been crafted. So everything about it. I mean. I was unsure of Robert Pattinson, okay. especially because I wanted to see Ben Affleck mm. in, in the yeah, role. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to see what he did with it. And I've seen Robert Pattinson in Tenet, and he was phenomenal in Tenet. So I thought, you know, yeah, he can carry the role, but I just didn't know whether I wanted to see him in the role. And you forget about it in like 30 seconds. Everything, every single thing about this film is crafted exquisitely mm. nothing is left out the music um using nirvana's song both in the trailer but tying it into the score um the acting pattinson's performance the casting of colin farrell as penguin who's almost unrecognizable but you know what the performance he pulls off behind that mask of prosthetics is brilliant setting it in the gritty world of the gangster-esque kind of the falcones where penguin isn't even the head poncho mm. yet mm. gives you scope for the future you've got zoe kravitz who's fantastic as catwoman you know little nods back to the series of eartha kit mm -hmm. and even the 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 homemade suit she has on is very much like you know the eartha kit 60s 
um, Catwoman, and that's brilliant too. So that this one kind of does sit with little nods to the, the to the '60s one, <clears throat> but getting close to Nolan's. But it's like you aptly said, it's essentially Seven versus mm-hmm. Batman. It's a serial killer movie. This is not a kids film. It's a serial killer movie about the Riddler who is part Zodiac killer, part Jigsaw from Saw. Mm. And that has never, ever been done before, never been done with that character. And they've had the, you know, the audacity and arguably the balls to make that character a real, real nut job, not just somebody who acts crazy, Mm -hmm. who is psychotic. Um, And Paul Dano plays it wonderfully. And considering... um, you hardly see his face till the end of the movie, a three-hour movie. Most of the film is in that kind of strange, yeah, yeah. ugly-looking mask. His performance is fantastic. And I, I read recently, there's a scene where he's on the phone on um, and, and sending videos on, on, on um, social media and things like that. And he did 200 takes himself with the phone. Yeah, yeah, just to yeah. trying different ideas out and things like that, and, and that's it's that's chilling. How that's what it takes to get to the results that you see, you know. And compared to some of the others we reviewed, where it was a rushed <clears throat> production, yeah. And the, there's no secrets, you know, when in particularly in anything you do in life and in work, but also for film. If you cut corners, if you're rushed and so on, you're not going to get the best uh, at, at all levels. Wow, listen, we spent an hour and a half looking at nine <laughs> Batman movies. Uh, it's flown by, I have to say. I mean, it's gone so quickly. There were some trailers I've not seen for a very, very long time. Others I've, I've watched so many times. I know them f- frame by frame. And it's just a wonderful addition. I mean, this is something you could literally have as a collection on your shelf of Blu-rays or, or 4Ks, and you'd just be pleased yeah. to have that um, execution in addition to the graphic novels, to the novelization, to um, you know the, the animations and so on. Wow. So? We're going to move on now to the next segment, just to kind of slow things down a bit. And this is one that you get a chance to learn a bit more about Paul and I, the host of Fun With Films. <laughs> Okay, so each time we do fun with films, we ask each other one question just to allow you to know a bit more about uh, Paul and I, but also to surprise each other. So I hope you don't mind, I'm going to begin with uh, my question to you. Bring it on. You may recall that we were talking about the 1989 Batman movie that I saw in France, and yes. that myself and a friend, we were the only one dressed as the Joker in the entire auditorium, probably the entire city of Bordeaux. Not embarrassing at all. Uh, only because we saw a documentary when we saw the Americans doing that, I said, well, let's do it. Um, if you were to dress as one of the villains... Not Batman, not Robin, not mm-hmm. Batgirl, but one of the villains. Who would it be and why? Catwoman, Poison <laughs> Ivy. No, um, uh, there, there's so many, so many I love. <sighs> right. Would it be the Riddler... Bane, Catwoman, Rachel Ghoul, Scarecrow, Harley Quinn, Joker, Penguin, Two Face, Poison Ivy, Mister Freeze, Mad Hatter, King Tut, Max Shrek. Mm. I think, I think actually one of my favorites is I like Mad Hatter, Jarvis Tetch, but I really like the Ventriloquist. Okay. Can you remember the ventriloquist? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, he was certainly in the animated series, and he's popped up in a lot of a lot of. Um, I, I think he's brilliant. The, the ventriloquist basically is kind of a normal looking, middle aged or older guy, glasses on, and in the comics and the animated series, the glasses is always kind of the shine of the sun, so you can never see his eyes. They're not dark glasses. It's always just the way the light plays, and he has his ventriloquist dummy that is like a mini Scarface. And basically, he's had a psychotic break where the person 
is the the henchman of the dummy, and he's got this little kind of Tommy gun mm. that that he can shoot people with with the dummy. I I love the ventriloquist, and it, it's some um, villain I'd like to see how somebody would pull off yeah. in in modern kind of cinema. <laughs> Definitely the ventriloquist, okay. not one of the well known ones, but yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Excellent. What about you, just to answer your own question? I think I would go for Scarecrow. Scarecrow is, yeah. Be- and actually, oddly, probably some kind of um, therapy because it's the, the one villain that makes me uneasy. And uh, the video games are very, very good. You know, the Ar- uh, yeah. Arkham Asylum and so on, they are very good. And the Scarecrow in the video game was really unnerving. Yeah, just a, uh, you know, a shout out because we know he's watching. Killian Murphy was brilliant in Batman Begins as Scarecrow. Yes. We know he watches us, you know, we, he's one of our friends. Um, <laughs> that was actually my, one of my questions to you. I, I always write more than one just in case. Yeah. Was what villain would more scare you? But you've already just answered that yeah. with Scarecrow. It just, Scarecrow. It just makes me uneasy a lot, you know, yeah. like. Well, I think the others, I would take them on even if I. But this one I would just run away. Well, I mean. Batman's biggest weapon is using fear. Mm. Scarecrow uses fear against you, so mm. yeah. But I got another question, just in case. So we've got our crossovers here, yes. like Batman and Predator. What crossover would you like to see made into a film if you could choose any character from any film, any medium, to see go up against Batman? So Batman versus... And then yeah, the next film that could take anybody from any universe, it could even be Thanos, you know, mm-hmm, you, mm-hmm, anything. Mm-hmm. What crossover would you like to see be Batman's adversary? I have to say, influenced no doubt by what you've shown, but in terms of uh, what he would look like, for me, it would have to be uh, Batman versus Predator. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, I don't know what just, it is about those two characters. I, I used to think Batman versus Robocop. Mm. But Batman v Predator, can you imagine in Gotham City, a bit like kind of Predator 2 where, you know, it comes to the to the city, but it's Gotham City yeah. and starts hunting down the Joker and it takes out the Joker and it takes out some of the, you know, the, the top guys. So Batman has to go against the one thing that can take out the people he's struggling to take out. I mean, Or, or wow. even they have to kind of for once work together because otherwise there'd be nothing yeah. for them to either be a villain for a hero. I mean, the one that um, I think would be intriguing, but it's almost, I would say, not nowhere near as exciting. But I think, oh, I wonder how that would play out would be uh, Batman versus Punisher. Because I think that would be a very you know interesting. Well, in the Marvel comic universe, there is Punisher kills mm-hmm. Deadpool. Punisher kills Wolverine. Punisher, you know, there there is a thing where Punisher being just human like Batman is takes out some of the big guys. That would be amazing to have the Punisher come to Gotham and decide that Batman is as guilty as everybody mm-hmm. else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Forget Predator. We're going with Punisher. <laughs> Get Dolph Lundgren back in the Punisher suit. Yeah, absolutely. That's been fun. Yes. Yeah. So, listen, everyone, thank you very much again for keeping up with um, this Batman special. At the end of every episode of Fun With Film, our long-form video magazine, we end up with a quiz. Now, when we invented Fun With Films, we thought it would be fun to call the quiz Riddle Me This, Riddle Me That. Little did we know that months later, it would be the perfect way to launch a quiz on this show. Wow, riddle me this, riddle me that. Who's afraid of the big black bat? So... We prepare three questions each. So this is for you to answer in the comments below, whether you're watching on replay on Facebook or live on YouTube as well. And yeah, just have fun. Let us know and do ask us some questions too. So we'll start with your first question. Paul. Right. Well, my first question was, riddle me this, riddle me that. Who's afraid of the what? <laughs> but we'll, we'll go on to the next one. Okay. 
in the 1966 Batman movie and or TV series, Adam West um, did a very, very famous, often memed bat dance. Okay. And this bat dance obviously um, influenced the name of bat dance in the 1989 soundtrack and this, that and the other. But the bat dance itself has a name. You can Google it. You'll get it on YouTube. <laughs> it's called The What. And Adam West has this crazy 60s dance that I kind of lampooned a little bit at the beginning. Um, that is, is is It's a thing. It's a thing in okay. back circles. All right, all right. What's the dance called? Okay. Well, over to you. Leave the, your answer in the comments below. My question, first question. We spoke about Alfred. Mm -hmm. um, very important character, Batman's butler. But actually, do you know his surname? Oh, mm. yeah, right. Okay, good one. good one. Nice so one. Over to you to try and answer this question. Paul, second question. Second question, right. I've got a few wrote down. All right, in 1989, the Michael Keaton, yep. Tim Burton, Batman movie, it came out in 1989, but it was an anniversary of the Batman character. Mm -hmm. What anniversary was it? Was it 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, or 70 year anniversary of Batman in 1989 when it came out? Okay, very good question. My question actually is related to that one. Oh. Which is, people talk about DC, but you must know that this stands for Detective Comics. Hence, why, particularly with the, the recent uh, the Batman, it is all about who done it. But it didn't wasn't the first superhero to appear in DC. Who was the first superhero to appear in the DC comic book series? Okay, mm -hmm. hey, these are good ones. <laughs> Righty, last one from me, I think. Right in Batman Forever, mm -hmm. which is a Val Kilmer Jim Carrey one. Okay. Two Face has not henchmen; he has hench women. He has two hench women. What were they called? Now, bonus if you can name the actresses as well. Okay, I think that's a hard one. That is a hard we're, one. We're going to be like decades ago, like, <laughs> even last century, literally. Okay, final question for me to do with weapons. Oh. We know that Batman has throwing weapons in the shape of a bat. What is the name of mm. that very sharp weapon that he can throw at people? Okay. Six mm. questions for so, you to um, get your little bat minds around. <laughs> to give you a bit of chance to um, ask around, think, Google if you have to, but nope, just cheating nope. a bit. We're going to give you a bit of time to think it through.
Oh my word! Wow. You see the back car, yeah. the old uh, yeah, Lincoln yeah, Fortuna, just wonderful. Okay, <laughs> you can't you can't have the smile when you it's, watch this. It's can you? it's so good. You know I, what you were getting for Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> you should play this around the world. People would be so much happier, and nicer to each for other. For sure. Yeah. All right, so your first question again, please. please. All right, my first question was, what is the name of the crazy 60s Adam West Batman dance? There's also where Adam West, as an older actor, did it on Conan O'Brien show as well, the the dance. It had a name. What was it? I have no idea. I'm going to say the Bat Shuffle. The Batusi. So if you Google, and I expect all of you to Google the Batusi, You'll get it. Okay. Do you remember Albert's surname? Albert being Alfred. What's Alfred. That's my with my with the names at the moment. Alfred's Batman's butler. Pennyworth. Pennyworth. Yeah, that's a proper British name, isn't it? The, there's a series as well. There's uh-huh. a Pennyworth a series. Yeah. So it's yes. interesting going back and seeing him, his character as a younger man. <laughs> very, very good. Yes. Ooh, before we move yeah. on, what's your favorite Alfred, or who was your favorite Alfred? Well, I, I like obviously um, both of them. You know, for me, it's Michael Goff because yeah. he was there the longest through the, the series. But I thought Michael Caine, in terms of the wise man and the father figure, was just outstanding. Yeah. Andy Circus, mm. I think, is a great casting for the new film, mm. and, but he isn't in it enough. It's probably my one critis- okay. criticism. But in Gotham, Sean Pertwee, his portrayal of um, Alfred is worth watching the series for. Mm. So it, he was brilliant as well. Uh, yeah. Your second question was, remind was, us. Was, 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 was. What anniversary um, was, what Batman anniversary sure. was it when Batman 1989, Tim Burton's version, was released? Sure. Well, Batman was um, you know, essentially revealed to the world in 1939 in DC Comics. Was Do the math. 27, so. Yeah. It was the 50th anniversary it was released mm. what was interesting just as a little uh, note in terms of the marketing they didn't initially play to that which is fascinating yeah they didn't say 50 years of 50th anniversary for the marketing of the 1989 was more like just pure bat mania but just flooded the market with merchandise and and the um you know the bat, bat logo that's it strangely didn't need it didn't need to okay to do it. so on on that point then Batman was not the first superhero mm. to be kind of that uh, came alive in the pages of DC comic books. Who was that first superhero? I'm going to say Superman, but to be fair, I'm, I'm guessing. It is Superman. It is, yeah. yeah it is it's, I, I know he was a little bit earlier yeah, than, than, than Batman. So. DC number one was, uh, yeah. was Superman. I mean, I, I'm imagining if somebody has a copy of that, that must cost absolute fortune. No, oh, yeah, yeah, you crazy. <laughs> I haven't, by the way. <laughs> I wish I did. Uh, but yeah, next one, right? The the two Batman Forever hench women of um, Tommy Lee Jones's mm-hmm. Two Face yes. were called. I cannot remember. Call it Sugar and Spice. One was all in white. One was all in black. Played by. Don't remember. Drew Barrymore. My God. Yeah, yeah, right. No, and no, no, I can picture it. Ding, yeah, 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 she she had the white hair and mm-hmm. all in white. And Debbie Mezzer, Mezzer, Mezzer was um, mm. the other one in, in black. Sugar and spice. <laughs> <laughs> and all things nice. That's very, very good. Right. Batman has many weapons, many vehicles and all sorts. But that was a one thing. A bladed weapon shaped like a bat that you could throw at people is called the Batarang. The Batarang, yes. What a name. Yes. What a name. Yeah. <laughs> right. Wow. This I, is I actually win one for once. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is excellent. Now, listen, normally we start to thank people, we start to wrap up the show and say our goodbyes, but I'm not going to let you go just <gasps> yet. I've got a bit of a surprise for you, and actually for you, our audience as well. It so happens that literally yesterday, if not even two days ago, Empire Magazine went through the Batman movies too. All right. And did a bit of a ranking. Now, that ranking was a bit more thorough because there was I- indeed some animations as well as some of the Justice League and Superman versus Batman and that kind of things. But looking at just the nine that um, we've got, what has been interesting right. is this is the running order according to Empire Magazine. So 
last, starting from the bottom, is Batman and Robin. Mm-hmm. Then we have Batman Forever. Batman, mm-hmm. 1966. The Dark I love Knight. how that's actually not right at the bottom <laughs> as well, I must yeah. say. The Dark Knight Rises, number six, right in the middle of the nine we've reviewed is the Batman that was released only a week ago. Mm-hmm. Batman Returns, number four. Number three, Batman Begins. Number two, the 1989 Batman. And number one, The Dark Knight. So this is, according to the Empire's kind of editorial team, and this is just, I wanted to kind of get your reaction. Does that match mm. your your own views on things? Would you move things around at all? I, yeah, no, I would move some things around for sure. Let mm-hmm. me have a think. Um, I would, I'd definitely say The Dark Knight has to be number one or number two, okay. definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually rate the new Batman so high that it would be up there in top three. Okay. And I know the reason for that is I know I can go back and watch it Mm -hmm. time and time again. Such a good film. And I know I'm going to see things I haven't seen the first time. Uh, Let me think. Probably the original 1989 Batman would come in at three. Batman Returns, I was never a huge fan of. There was things I liked about it. There was things I didn't. It It started to get a little bit campy for me even back then. So I would probably say The Dark Knight Rises would come next. Mm. Then Batman Begins. I'm not that much of a fan of the first Nolan one. I've probably seen it too many times, but I don't go back to watch it very often. So Mm -hmm. Batman Begins would be five. Um, Then Batman Returns would Mm -hmm. be next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, the sixty six Batman would come in. Then forever. Then Robin. Okay. Yeah, not at all. So I've had a small advantage because I've done have this list for a while. So for me, I would literally switch um, number two and number four. So for me, Batman Returns yep. would be number two. Yep. It's one that just connected with me. Um, so Batman nineteen eighty nine would be number four. And I would switch Batman Begins with Dark Knight Rises. For me, Dark Knight Rises would be, therefore, number three. Yep. And literally, you know, and I've not seen the Batman, so I can't comment on that. But for me, Batman Begins is not as good as the Dark Knight Rises. So yep. just needs to kind of sure. go in that order. But that would say that, unfortunately, because of the the feeling that I was left with when I first saw them, I would agree that Batman Forever and Batman and Robin are last in the list of a very, very good list, by the way. So yeah. I would have those on my shelf. I would watch them again. But, um, you know, your point about how often would you go back to a film? Yeah. You talk about, for example, how often you know, go back to Rogue One compared to the others, you know. I would say that would be in the order in which I would happily go, go back to them. But that's the cool thing. If we look at this list, if I want to watch something just for me, mm. I'll probably watch... The Batman or The Dark Knight. They're long films. I can really get into it and engage on a cerebral level. But if I want to watch something with some kids, yeah, you know, some nephews yeah, or, or kids yeah. or whatever, yeah, Batman it's Forever, Batman so Robin is the one. Mm-hmm. If you want to watch something with Pascal and get nostalgic, Batman, Batman Returns. They're, mm-hmm. they're the one. They're, there's kind of something for everybody in there. Mm. If I want to watch something to just have a giggle and take me back to my childhood, 1966 <laughs> Batman. Yes. And yeah. that's the beauty of this list. None of them are overtly bad. They just serve completely different purposes with the same character. Uh, do you know that is so in the spirit of fun with films as well, to have an open mind, literally also an open heart, to kind of realise as we've said before, it is just a miracle that even a film gets made in For the sure. first place. So let's appreciate that. You know, we have access to those, um, particularly at the time where there are some places in the world where they can't even have access to information, let alone yeah. a, a cinematic experience. So There yeah. is the fact as well that, you know, in 1995, when I watched Batman Forever, I was a certain age myself. Mm-hmm. I'm a different age now, and I'll view that film very differently. I can watch it for me, or I can watch it with nephews or kids or daughters or whatever, um, but I'm a different person. I see the film differently, and whereas I didn't like it at the time, and I did struggle with Batman Returns at the time because I was of a certain age, a certain mindset, had certain expectations, I will watch them now completely differently. No. I'm a different human being. That's absolutely the pleasure. Talking of uh, pleasure, 
we have spent exactly two hours talking about Batman. Uh, this is uh, shouldn't be allowed, really. <laughs> it, it should it, it should be forced upon every human being once so, a um, week. You know, once again, thank you for, for coming all the way My pleasure, to sir. the home studio. Thank you to all of you watching it live and on replay and just joining in, in in the fun. And like I said, an idea that came to us maybe two, three days ago and we managed to turn it around. So thank you to the filmmakers and to everybody on YouTube making those trailers available. And to Pascal for making this work. No problem at all. And to Empire Magazine as well to give me a little, a little extra surprise for my co-host and co-pilot here. So until the next one, please go out there and watch lovely films. Let us know as well what kind of themes or perhaps um, actors or directors you'd like us to explore. We uh, come back once a month with a long-form video magazine and we would love to know that um, you're enjoying watching it and listening to it as well as uh, contributing to some of the decision and the editorial content. There's also, if you come across a trailer for something new coming out or a new mm. TV show, just hit one of us up to say, hey, have you seen this? What do you think about it? And we'll do a little kind of 10 or 15 minute chat about it. Yeah. Last one. If you are a filmmaker, if you are a film producer and you've got a new project on the way, it'd be lovely to include you in our Watchmen um, segment where Ooh, we give yeah. recommendations on what to watch. And to that point... If your work is um, really something that we can get excited and get behind, we can also include that in our toilet talk as well. Um, or if you are a performer, actor, <laughs> actress, Scott yes. Atkins. Scott Atkins, I'm yeah. sure you want to come and talk to us about do. all of your movies. You do. <laughs> Trying to use a Batman persuasion. <laughs> <technique. Yeah. laughs> okay. Everyone, take Thank care you now. guys. You're a very naughty boy.